join us as we sing our opening song this morning. I'll fly away. So glad you're
Fathers, don't raise your hands too early because then kids will start giving you money. We don't want them to give you money. We want, we want them to give you pens. <laughs> Once they come forward, you can raise your hands. Once you guys drop off the, you might grab a couple of these kids and then go find someone. These are Father's Day gifts. Go find someone who, who's got their hand raised. They look like they're a father, maybe a grandfather. And then when you're done with that, don't forget to come back because we do have a children's story. It is a big deal. This is an opportunity. We, we do a couple things. We do the live nativity scene every year. The Vacation Bible School is, is our mission outreach to our young kids. And so we not only need the kids, but we're going to need somebody to build a spaceship. We're going to need somebody to build uh, space rocks. We're going to have to have money to people for decorations. So get your hearts in the right places because let's make this a fantastic time for the kids. July of All right. I think I have almost everybody back. Let's have a children's story. All right, you guys. How many of you have ever felt an earthquake? Whoa, you have? Okay. Well, if you haven't ever felt an earthquake, Sonoma County actually gets quite a few earthquakes because we live, we live near some like volcanic areas and, and geysers and things. So every once in a while, if you feel something, you kind of go... That's an earthquake. All right. Well, not too many years ago, there was a big earthquake in an area called Armenia. And there was this father who felt the earthquake, and he just felt the earth shake for a long time. He said, oh, my son's at school. I need to go find my son. So he went to the school, and guess what he saw? The school wasn't there anymore. And there were people over there crying. They said, all is lost. The school is gone, and our students are gone. And the father just wouldn't get, his, get up because he said, I, I know my son is in there, and I promised that I'd always be there for him. So the father just started digging and digging and digging, pushing rocks away and dirt and dust. Nobody would help him. And he dug for four hours. He dug for 10 hours. He dug for 12 hours. He dug for 24 hours. And he dug for 36 hours. He dug for 38 hours. And after 38 hours, he heard a voice. He said, Armand. That's his son's name, Armand. He said, Daddy, Daddy, it's me, Armand. And so he kept digging and digging. He found his son was alive after a day and a half. And not only that, he pulled the rocks away. And there were 13 other students right there. They were in a little pocket that was saved from the earthquake. And he said, Daddy, I told my friends... Don't be afraid because my father is coming for me. And when he saves me, he'll save you too. Isn't that a good story? I think it's really good. And that shows that the father had promised his son that he would always be there for him. And don't be afraid because he'll always come for him. And, and there's a verse in the Bible that says exactly that. Actually, it's in several places in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 31. Just flip off this is with the right hand. The Lord said, Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. God will always be with you in those hard times. So if you're ever afraid, if you ever feel an earthquake, don't be afraid. God will be there with you. Guys, thanks for listening so good. Tell your fathers happy Father's Day. Have a good time.
it dawned on me that, you know, as Christians, as Adventists, we celebrate Father's Day every Sabbath. It's a day that we come here to worship our Father. So this morning, I want you to stand and join us as we continue in worship and song. Blessed be your name.
Parents set an appetite denying discipline to better concentrate on God. Don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, act normally, act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention getting devices. He won't overlook what you are doing. He'll reward you well. This is the time now that we can come to God in prayer. So if you have a blessing or a praise request, you come forward. If you would mind joining me, uh, in a meal prayer, I appreciate that. Father, wow, what an opportunity to call you Father on Father's Day weekend. We are so blessed to be able to see and witness you as our Father through Jesus. It is our prayer that we will be able to treat others, our children, our families, just as you treat us. So to, to do that, we ask the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, our minds. Thank you for an opportunity that we have to worship together on the Sabbath day, sacred, holy, in this place. We love you. Please bless Pastor Brad as he gives us the message this morning. And keep him safe as he travels um, on vacation after this. We appreciate his service to this community. And so we leave all your care knowing that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, this is a, a special weekend, and we're so glad that you are here to worship with us because there's two holidays this weekend. There is Father's Day, which I'm excited to uh, spend even more time with my kids on Father's Day because uh, that's how I've learned how it works. Father's Day, you spend all your time with the kids. Mother's Day, you spend none of your time with the kids. That's, that's what I've been led to understand. Uh, but we also, this is also the weekend of Juneteenth, and so I've asked... Keith, to share a little bit about freedom for us today. Duty is, of course, a newish holiday uh, for the United States, a couple of years old. But in actual fact, I want to draw our attention to the fact that God loves freedom. And we always say, God loves freedom, and we think of this in spiritual terms. But I want to remind you that God loves freedom in the sense that we think about freedom. That is personal action and not being owned by anybody. Remember, when the children of Israel came together and were being created as a nation, one of the things that God said was, after every seven years, Every slave has the right to choose whether to be a slave or not. And then, after every 50 years, whether slaves want to be slaves or not, every single slave was set free. And here's the kicker for those of you that love to discuss political things. All the slaves were supposed to be given the wages that they had earned in the time that they were slaves. In the year of Jubilee, as it was called. And so when Christ talks about the year of Jubilee uh, in his famous sermon, he's actually not just referring to spiritual salvation, he's referring to this physical idea that God loves freedom, wants us all to be free, because God believes that when we are personally free, we can personally agree to join him as one of his children. And so as you're thinking about Juneteenth, and you've got the burgers, oh, the veggie burgers, right, 
You've got the vegetables on the fryer or the griller, etc., etc., etc. Remember that this holiday, in one sense, is as spiritual a holiday as Christmas, for example, because God loves freedom. Well, happy Sabbath. So glad that you are here to join us as I do my, my regular Sabbath morning dance of trying to not trip while I move the pulpit. Want to call your attention to just a couple of things this morning as we kick off. Exercise done for the day. <laughs> the, the first thing that I want to let you know is this week, uh, this next week I should say, when you call and I don't answer, it's not, and this is only true for this week, it's not because I'm ignoring you. Any other week, if I don't answer, I probably don't ignore you. <laughs> but this week, if I don't answer, it's because I'm on vacation. I'll be back next. I'll be back next Saturday. But uh, so if I don't answer, it, 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 there's there are real reasons. I'm sleeping. Uh, the second thing I want to highlight before we dive into the Lord's Word together is many of you maybe don't know that um, our church hosted a financial peace university for the last nine to ten weeks. Is that right? And uh, just gra- had their graduation this last week and. I'm going to tell you what happened, and then we're going to do a little bit of recognition. uh, Because I just had some amazing numbers shared with me by uh, one of our leaders. The group that gathered for Financial Peace University, during the course of that nine weeks, canceled $90,000 worth of debt. That's amazing. They saved $20,000. And they cut up 50 credit cards. I mean, it's just fantastic. Uh, so another note of freedom. And I want to just invite uh, Jim and John Dye to stand up for a second. And Mark Salavant as well. They uh, led and championed the whole thing. It is a wonderful work of ministry. And we're so grateful to you all for your part in, the, in those stories because those are those are life changes that have happened. Absolutely. We have been studying on again and off again the Sermon on the Mount. And it, we, that's because we have, on again and off again, been studying the book of Matthew. And in the heart of the Sermon of the, on the Mount, Matthew is recording the words of Jesus, and Jesus is really trying to lay out what does life look like for the people of God? That's that's the question that Jesus is answering during the Sermon on the Mount. What does life look like for the people of God? I want to uh, just call your attention to the screen here. We're going to put on a video here in a moment. The the reality is that Jesus today, he's talking a little bit about needs. And needs, I think, are an important thing for us to discuss in church. Because they're an important part of culture. We, We live in a culture that is very interested in letting us know what we need. And in fact, uh, about 50 years ago now, the California milk people, I don't know, group, lobby, started an ad campaign that you're probably familiar with. Anybody know the two-word ad campaign I'm thinking of? It was a vector. Got milk. Exactly. And I want to just give you a sense of how Mr. Miller teaches us about what we need. Maybe. Possibly. Or not. We're going to try it another day. <laughs> the God Love Campaign is all about telling you what, what do you need to live a healthy, full life? 
You need milk. And, and it's really at the center of our culture to tell us exactly what we need. Whether that is that you need to buy this makeup so that you can look beautiful. You need to buy these clothes so that you can present yourselves as a professional. You, you need to buy this book or watch this movie so that you can be accepted. Our world is constantly trying to tell us what we need. And Jesus, in this brief little passage in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, is inviting us to reconsider and reorient how we understand our needs. He begins in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. It's a simple little passage. If I were being honest, I would tell you that in almost 15 years of being a pastor, I've never thought I should talk about fasting. In fact, I should talk about this particular passage. It seems a little dry. Can we be honest today? You haven't read this passage and thought, oh, this is going to be hard hitting and my life will be different in 20 minutes. <laughs> what is the deal? What is, what is fasting really? It's kind of become important in our culture. Maybe lately you've, you've become familiar with fasting from a health perspective. That people are really into intermittent fasting. They'll, they'll fast for 16 hours and they'll eat for 8 hours or, or what have you. I, I am a big fan of, of six, a 16 hour eating window. Eat for 16 hours and fast for 8 hours. But, who knows? It's become important, but what, what did fasting mean for Jesus? And more to the point, why does Jesus talk about fasting basically at the center of the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, it, it, this is prime real estate. There are 2,000 years of people giving attention to these words, and Jesus spends the precious few that he has, he spends them talking about fasting. What is that about? Back in the 1930s, there was a doctor, Maslow is his name, who came up with this pyramid that you may be familiar with. It's Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and it's become incredibly influential in Western society. It, in essence, outlines what people need to actualize themselves as people, to, to be healthy as people. And, and it begins like... Uh, your, your food pyramid, right? Your food pyramid begins perhaps like me with donuts and then it moves up in order of magnitude or uh, it moves up in lessening magnitude of importance, right? So the foundation is most important. And so Maslow's hierarchy of needs begins with, well, just physiological needs. You, you need air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing. These are the, the basic needs. If you can't, if you don't have these, Nothing else really matters. And, and once those needs are met, then you have safety needs, personal security, employment, health, property. And, and once those needs are met, then you can, then you can have love and belonging, this, these community needs, friendship, intimacy, family, the sense of connection. And, and from there, you can build esteem, respect for others, respect, self-esteem for yourself. You can seek recognition and strength and freedom, as we mentioned earlier. And finally, self-actualization is at the top of this pyramid. The desire to become the most that one can be. This has, whether you know it or not, been really at the foundation of how we've built society. This is right at the heart of our education system. 
It's at the heart of our health system. It's the heart of, of decisions that are made in government. And it's really what advertising, like gotten milk or anything else, is speaking into. It, advertising, marketing is built entirely around the concept that this product meets an essential need for you. This Coca-Cola is going to create, watch your Coca-Cola app. They're almost always about refreshing, right? Or they're about community, right? You watch an advertisement as, oh, it's a hot day, and oh, they just got their, their Coke. It, it's, or it's, it's a group of people, diverse and all beautiful in different ways, and they're, they're laughing around the table, and, and each of them has a perfectly pristine glass bottle of Coke somehow with the perspiration just perfectly placed on the bottle. You, you know what I'm talking about. And, and it's all meant to tell us this product, this set of beliefs, this policy, this politic, this group, this philosoph philosophy, it, it, it is meant to say this is how you meet this felt need. Jesus, though, in the Sermon on the Mount, is asking us to reconsider our needs. What does that have to do with fasting? I'll, I'll tell you that I have, in fact, I'll confess, that I've never really understood fasting. I, I have mostly considered it just serious prayer. Like, when I really want God to know I'm serious about my prayer request, I fast. It's like a prayer request in bold, or all caps. That, that's been my perspective of fasting. Like, I really, really want this job, or I really, really want this person to be well, and so I, I've thought, oh, that's, that's what fasting is. It's, it's to make sure God definitely heard my prayer request. Um, it's, it's almost this toddler view of, well, I'm just not going to eat until I get what I want. Jesus, though, he, he paints this picture. He, he assumes, by the way, that his followers, the people of God, will fast. And when you fast, not an if, when you fast, and then he gets into some language. Do, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Jesus is talking about the, the fact that fasting was sort of used as a public display of piety. We've been talking about how the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, were sort of influencers. They, they did their acts of worship on street corners with crowds. And fasting was no different. They would, they would change their clothing and, and moan on the street corners, Oh, Lord! And Jesus is speaking directly to it. He said, look, don't, don't do it to be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. The, the attention that they've got from the people seeing them disfigure their faces, in fact, that's their reward. But when you fast, Jesus is assuming that we will fast. Not, not an if, when you fast. Anoint your head and wash your face. So, so when you fast, you're, you're supposed to not let anyone know. In fact, when you fast, Jesus is saying, put on your best face. Brush your teeth. Wash your hair. My wife might even be thinking, Brad should fast more. Then he would do those things. It, it, it's meant to be put to your best self when you are fasting. <clears throat> that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. <clears throat> fasting in the Bible is interesting. 
What, what is it? Is a question I've been wrestling with this week. Because this isn't just super serious prayer. This is something separate. We just last week talked about prayer. This is now a, a new topic. Fasting, what, what is it? When we read scripture, we find out that fasting was a big deal for God's people. For, for thousands of years, God's people could be identified as people who fast. They, and there are really three categories of fasting that we find in Scripture. The first is that there is a fasting that is a response to God's work in our lives. In fact, just six months ago when we were in Matthew chapter 3, because it's been a slow series, I admit. Jesus has this remarkable experience. He, he goes to be baptized by John the Baptist, and when he is baptized at the end of Matthew chapter 3, the, the heavens open and God speaks, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. There's a beam of light. The soundtrack picks up. It's awesome. Now, we all know that when something really exciting happens, our response is that we party, right? But Jesus responds in a different way. Matthew chapter 4 begins with Jesus leaving the baptistry, the Jordan River in this case, and going to the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days. The response of Jesus so the blessing of God in his life was to fast. <laughs> this is a little bit of an unusual response for us culturally, right? We, we, we would have, I just got baptized, the God spoke at the baptism, it was great. We're having a cake, bring food, this is going to, Jesus, no, no, no. I, I'm just going to go and spend 40 days by myself without food. Fill in the blanks of my nightmare. <laughs> so in Scripture, again and again, we find God's people responding to His blessing with fasting. Second category we see in Scripture. The, the second category of fasting that we find in Scripture, and it's almost... It's probably the most common. Is that the people of God turn away from wrongdoing with a fast. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7, Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, have, they have been worshipping idols. They've set up all of these, these pagan symbols in their, their places of worship in their homes. And, and Samuel, the, the God's leader of the people during that time in their history, has, has led them out of that wrongdoing. They're putting away all of these pagan practices. And in, in response to saying, we're done with living this way, the whole nation, all everybody, all of God's people have a national day of fasting. De really, it is a demarcation of their decision to change their lives, to turn away from what they had previously been doing. The third form of fasting that we find in Scripture is a response to tragedy. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah, this leader of not God's people, but actually leader in another country. And amongst the, the Medes and the Persians, he, he receives word from his hometown, Jerusalem, the, the capital city of God's people, that it is just in ruins. And they are constantly facing fear and, and raiding by their enemies that live around them. And he is so broken by the news that his people and his hometown are facing such difficult times that he fasts for days, Scripture says, as a response to the tragic state of his nation and the plight of his people. We see that again and again in Scripture. 
In fact, there is this, this sense in Scripture of sackcloth and ashes. That, that when you are confessing your sins, when you are mourning, there is this incredibly physical response. You, you wear like just sackcloth, you, you throw ashes on your head, you, you go without food, all to sort of live in your pain. And you are maybe saying, these things are all very different from how we interact with realities in our own lives, right? We don't celebrate with fasting, we celebrate with feasting. We, we don't turn away from wrongdoing with, with fasting. We quietly pretend like it didn't happen. <laughs> We don't even demarcate our morning with fasting. We have a feast. Everybody has a, a hosted meal after a funeral service. But fasting had this very central place for God's people. So, let's get back to that core question. That, that's what it was. That's what Jesus is speaking into when he says, when you fast. But what is fasting? Besides just going for a, a certain amount of time, almost always about a day in Scripture, without food. Fasting takes us on a journey of rightly orienting our hierarchy of needs. Fasting is a powerful practice of putting God where He belongs, at the base of our pyramid of needs. It is the active action of putting God as the foundation of what it is to be human. It, it is saying, literally, the thing that I do every day, food, that base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological need. Fasting is saying, Actually, I need God more than I need food. Amen. And the, the most common thing that, that we all do, well, I mean, some of us more than others, but all of us do, fasting is saying that I need God more than that. Fasting is an inversion. In, in this sense, we, we know viscerally the experience of going without food. And so we avoid it, right? The, the, the way, the craziness that comes over people if they haven't had something to eat, for the most part, by 10 o'clock in the morning, is why? Right? The, the, the looks on people's faces as the pastor drones on and on through lunch is very familiar to me. <laughs> Fasting, though, is, it is an, an inversion because we know what it is to go without food and so we avoid it like the plague. Fasting, though, is, is taking us through the experience that faith is more than food. We don't avoid spiritual fasting with anything approaching our vigor for physical fasting or the avoidance of it. Who among us has unthinkingly gone for a whole day without eating? Nobody unthinking. It's pretty rare, right? You've never woken up and said, silly me, I forgot to eat yesterday. And maybe that's happened, maybe you fasted, but it wasn't unthinking. You were hard on that. But that, that's the point. Who among us, though, has unthinkingly gone for a whole day without a practice of faith. Oh, I forgot to pray yesterday. When was the last time I spent time with God? And so fasting is this inversion. It is saying, we know what it is to go without food. But in fact, it is worse to go without faith. I am saying it's more important, more vital. It is more of what makes me human. So I'm going to go without food. In order to reorient myself around this new hierarchy of needs. That God is in fact the most vital thing to my essence. 
Fasting is the practice of rightly orienting our lives around faith as our most important need. And so notice the place that Jesus gives fasting. Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, His most famous sermon, directly after the Lord's Prayer, arguably the most well-known part of His most famous sermon. Jesus has our attention. And His decision is, I'm going to use this moment where all eyes are on me to say, when you fast. Why? Why? Jesus, in fact, here at the opening verses of Matthew chapter 6, has delivered a trio of spiritual practices. At the beginning of the chapter, he, he introduces generosity. Then, as I just mentioned, he introduces prayer. And finally, third, he introduces fasting. Fasting is placed by Jesus as one of the three most important spiritual practices. I'll be honest, this has blown my mind this week. Because I don't do it. I don't do it. <laughs> I'm your pastor. And my perspective until this week has been that fasting was just uber prayer. <laughs> but, but I want you to know that there is so much here in God's Word about fasting. I mean, to, to the degree that I promise you we will be revisiting this topic in the coming months. Way more than we can do in one morning is all that there is in fasting. Lest you be forced to fast in order for me to go through it all. <laughs> I, I want you to imagine that perhaps your story is similar to mine. That fasting has had almost no place in your spiritual life. Maybe that's not true. But I'm just suggesting that might be true. And, and I want you to imagine what we would think collectively of a church that decided to opt out of prayer as a spiritual practice. You know, just a church that just said, you know, prayer is, is great, but it's not really our thing. We, we get awkward closing our eyes around other people. You know, it's just not. I mean, we would have deep concerns about that community, wouldn't we? I mean, we would talk about, oh, boy, you wouldn't believe those, ad, those, those Adventists over on the other part of town. But they never pray. Right? I mean, this would be cause for concern. And yet... Jesus has just placed fasting in terms of level of importance on the same tier as prayer. And we don't do it. We've, we've opted out of a vital spiritual practice. One which, by the way, has been central to the faith experience of thousands of years worth of God's people. All up until about a hundred years ago. When the church, for whatever reason, just said, eh, food's good. Maybe we could go with that, that whole thing. We need to be generous. Jesus says. We, we need to pray, Jesus says. We, we need to fast. But why? We, we know, well, I have to pray. Why? It's prayer. I, I have to be generous. Why? Well, I'm a Christian. Jesus is suggesting, well, I have to fast. Why? Well, because it's fasting. And, but I'll, I'll press it a little bit more. Because I, I think there's, there's a bit more there that we should Uncover what? Why? Why be generous? Why? Why pray? Why fast?
In the first three passages of Matthew chapter 6, there is a line that is repeated three times. And I, I'll just give you a, a free tip. You don't even have to pay for it. That, that when you're reading the Bible and something is repeated twice, that's a, okay, I sh I'll, I'll maybe just check it. But when something is repeated three times, that's a, 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 a five alarm fire of like, hey, 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 this right here, look at it, pay attention. And we get three repetitions of the same line in about 18 verses. It's this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 4, 6, and 18. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Three times. In, in just a handful of chapters. And this is the Bible saying, hey, hey, did you catch that? It is, it's the simplest form of teaching. Repetition. Did you catch that? What does that mean? Why, why do we get it? It is a simple question in the English. Jesus is asking, are you doing X for the attention of others or for the attention of the Father? Jesus is, in fact, telling us how to have a relationship with our Father. I moved away from home about 13 years ago, graduated from college, got married, hit the open road, drove to South Dakota. And leaving home changed my relationship with my dad. It was much more difficult to ask him for money. It was much more difficult for him to tell me to do things. It, it was very weird. And, and I would tell you that probably for the first two, three years, maybe even more, uh, we didn't talk a whole lot. Certainly less than we, we did when we were living under the same roof. But then something happened. We had children. And bills started to come more rapidly. And I had this moment of realization. You know who knows how to deal with kids, kind of? I mean, that's generous. Who sort of knows how to deal with kids. And who definitely knows how to deal with bills. My dad. And so I put my dad's phone number in second place on my favorites list of my phone, <laughs> right under my wife, and I drive a lot for work. And so one of the things that I almost always do when I'm driving is I'll pull out my phone and I'll call someone just to talk and stay awake. And so I began to pretty regularly, oh, oh yeah, I, I just talked with my wife, I better, second name on the list, call dad. And so I just started calling Dad. And, and I would tell you that over the last probably 10 years, I have a closer relationship with my dad than I ever did when we were living under the same roof. We just talk all the time. Once or twice, three times a week. It's nothing ever that crazy. It's not always a request for money. It's just sometimes just touching up. <laughs> not always. <laughs> And it's built this deep relationship. If you read about help building healthy relationships, you will always be offered advice on how to build healthy habits. It doesn't matter what the relationship is, whether it is parenting, friendships, business, marriage, all of it will be boiled down in terms of advice to habits. Whether it is, don't, don't go to bed angry with your wife. You need to have a, a, a yearly time to spend with your friends. Your children, you need, to have, you need to have breakfast or dinner together every day or five days a week. Habits are the foundation of building relationships. 
Generosity, prayer, and fasting are the habits that Jesus is suggesting constitute the essentials of having a relationship with the Father. We need to habitually practice generosity. We need to habitually practice prayer. And we need to habitually practice fasting. And I want to really today emphasize fasting. Because fasting is the craziest one. You know, I, I can build a habit of prayer and it's just, you know, hey, two minutes of prayer, five minutes of prayer. I can build a habit of generosity and just say, I'm going to give a dollar bill to everyone who asks. Th th these are small things. Fasting, though, is a habit that is difficult to maintain. Because I can't say, all right, I did a five minute fast, God, whoo, life changing stuff. I did my fast for today, right? I can't even do an hour long fast and say, Lord, be in awe of my holiness. I went a whole hour without consumption. A, a fast is the sort of habit that really takes time. It, it's the sort of habit I would suggest to you is hard to become so habitual that it becomes unthinking. It, it, it takes effort, I would suggest to you, to just say, I'm going to go 24 hours without food. And maybe Jesus had so habitually built up his habit over his first 30 years of life that for him, a fast meant 40 days. I'm not there, friends. <laughs> but we need to fast. I, I honestly couldn't tell you today, this is what's going to happen if you build a habit of fasting. I don't know. People in the days of Jesus had a day of the week that they fasted on. Thursdays or Tuesdays, based on my research. The Pharisees, who were really who were really serious, they fasted on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We need to fast. I don't know what the results of that really will be. All I really know is that Jesus thinks it's important. He did it. And fasting is how we will be reorienting our lives around God as our most basic need. Let's pray to you. Lord, we thank you because sometimes you give us simple and direct advice when you fast. Now that sounds crazy. And we're not even totally clear on, on, on what the outcome is. Generosity, I, I get it, it makes sense. People who, who need are receiving something. Prayer, it makes sense. I, I'm communicating to you. I'm, I'm sharing my request. But fasting is just to go without. But you demonstrate it. You ask for it. And so we ask you. Because we want to build a relationship to help us find the place that it has in our lives. Because we believe that you are our most basic need. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.